It's time to begin. Glad you've taken time out this on this Wednesday day to come and study God's Word together with us. If you're visiting with us, you're an honored guest. We're glad you're here. Glad to see all the members out as we uh, continue our our study through the overcoming the sins that are plague us on an everyday basis. Tonight we're going to talk about the sin of fear. Last week was the sin of gossip, and this week is the sin, sin of fear. And I ask everyone not to be afraid of this class. It's, uh, it's, it's not that bad. And, and if you would, everybody speak out and speak up. So this would be a very good time to overcome that fear of speaking out in class. This would be the opportune time to make that happen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this time that you've, we've uh, set aside to study thy word, and we're so thankful that you have, have readily made your word available to us, your will for mankind, your plan of salvation. You've revealed to us your Son, who is a direct reflection of you, and we ask you, Father, to help us be a direct reflection of, of Christ as we live here upon this earth as well. We're thankful for all the blessings you give us in this land we live in. We are, are blessed beyond measure here in the United States. We're thankful for that, and we ask you to continue to bless us if it be your will. We ask you to be with those who are less fortunate and help us as we see those people that are, are less fortunate to, to share our good measure with them. And especially, Father, help us be willing to share your story with them. We ask you to be with those who are, uh, have lost many things in this world due to the, to the, the hurricane that hit Texas and the one that is approaching Florida at this time. Father, I ask you to be with those people and help them seek safety and uh, refuge and help them to realize that these things on this earth are temporal. Help them to realize that you are in control of this, this world and the, the very elements that they will be seeing before their, their eyes and affecting their lives are elements that you put here upon this earth. Help us be mindful of the great might and power you have. Help us to realize that you are in control and you find things of this world insignificant to those things of the hereafter. And help us, help us Father, and help the, the, the classes throughout this building learn more about you to better understand the way you are and, and how you treat people how you care for us, and help us share that with other people. We're thankful for your son, the sacrifices he went through to come here to this earth to live a life of purity before you and before mankind, the example for us to follow. Help us be mindful of the, the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary for, for our sins. Help us reflect our life on, on his every day of our life here on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the Bible uses the word fear a lot in the same way that, that we use the word fear today. And one of the first ones that the, uh, the writer points out to us is, the, is the reverence and respect. And in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, we see there, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, is that a like fear and trembling that something's going to happen to you? In Ecclesiastes, is that what the writer's talking about there? Like a fear and trembling. Is that what he's talking about? He's talking about respect. Right. He's talking more about the, the respect, that we need to respect and be reverent to God in this case. Or to anyone in authority. And then we see another uh, use of the word fear, and that's a, the, like a, an anxiety, like something is or about to happen that's bad, and we want to uh, you know, show anxiety, if you will, to, towards that. And we see, we see both of the uses of the word fear in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 21, and that's at, at the case of Mount Sinai, when 
God rumbled and showed his great might, and then he went and talked to Moses. So the people, the people in that, in that instance, at, they were afraid that something bad was going to happen. They talked to Moses and said, you go talk to God. We don't want to have any part of this. And then Moses explains to them that he wants, God wants them to fear him. Not, but not fear him out of, hey, something bad is going to happen if we don't listen to him, but out of respect through all the things that God's going to do for the Israelites. And in Exodus chapter 20, verses 19 through 20, it reads there, And they said unto Moses, Speak thus with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove, to prove you that, you've, that uh, his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. We see there both, both cases or both incidences are use of the word uh, fear. So what is wrong with fear? What's one of the first things wrong with fear? I'll give you a big, big, big clue. It's up there. We're getting over this fear of speaking out in class. What is it? It's paralyzing. So, so, yeah. so what you've got up there is keeps one confessing to Christ. Freezes us and paralyzes us because we're afraid of what the reaction is going to be or what people are going to think about us. And so we're, we're paralyzed. We're, we don't know what to do in, in the face of that fear. So it's acting. And, and why, why are we afraid of that? So why are we? Why are we afraid of how other people are going to react? I think because we want to be accepted. We're afraid that they might reject us. Yeah. And anybody have anything else? So let's read a couple of the verses there. In Matthew, let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. And we see here a promise. We see a promise from God that should help us get over that, that fear of confessing him, that, that fear that keeps us from confessing him. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, it says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever should deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And then a couple other verses there for you to, to you know, to, to, to look at. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and read verse, uh, in John chapter 12, verses uh, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I see this sometimes in the workplace. Where if you can say some things about God, but if you go saying too much about God, we see it in the school systems too. If we say too much about God, somebody's going to have to come and have a talk with us. Or we'll be heading down to the human resources to have a talk with the human resources because we're... Um, violating somebody's conscience. But that shouldn't shut us completely up. If we don't confess God before man, it's pretty bleak for us. Another thing with fear is it keeps our faith a secret. And I, so why did Joseph of Marathia, uh, 
Amarathia keep his faith a secret? Why do you suppose he kept it a secret? In John chapter 18, and verse 38, it reads, And after this, Joseph of Ar Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And we know that Joseph put Jesus' body in Joseph's tomb. But it says here, he kept it a secret. Why would he have done that? In fear of his life, that he might be put to death. Yeah, at that time, it was life, or if not life, at least his social status. Something was going to be affected, and he was afraid of that. So he let that, he let that make some decisions for him instead of, um, instead of him being out in public and, and admitting what he should admit. So how, how are we today, Craig? Well, if you think about it, the, the reason... It seems like the reason that people don't talk about their faith or they try to keep things a secret um, and not bring it up is because if you embrace that, then ultimately you're, you are saying, I am embracing self-denial and you're asking people around you to embrace self-denial and not do what they want to do or give up what they consider to be their rights. And people don't like to talk about that. It makes them uncomfortable. Um, makes them uncomfortable to think that they're living in a way that maybe isn't right, uh, or that you professing how you're living is condemning to them in some way, even if that's not what you're trying to do. And so overall, that's, I think, why a lot of people keep a secret, and then because of the consequences that come with that. Ridicule, persecution, uh, difficulty, but, you know, the verse that you know, get to your minute with, you know, about letting our light shine is what God asks us to do. So it takes pushing through fear to be able to do that. Yeah, even though we don't necessarily verbally uh, you know, condemn them for their actions, they know that our stance on Christianity and our stance on doing evil versus good, it's, it is self-condemning. And it's actually their own conscience that they're fighting with but they want to push it off on someone else and blame someone else. It keeps people from obeying God. And we see that in, you know, saw a couple of instances in the Old Testament. He, he points out here, Amalek and, and then Saul of Tarsus, or not Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul of the Old Testament, uh, King Saul, They both uh, transgressed God's command and, you know, and didn't obey God, which cost them dearly. So what happened, what happened to the servant who buried his ta master's talent during the, in the, the parable of the talents where one, ta one, one man had you know, five, three, and then one talent? In Matthew chapter 25, if you would go ahead, and let's, let's go ahead and, and read that. It starts out with, so that man with the first talent, when it got down to the, to the, to the person with the first talent, or with the one talent, I'm sorry, it starts out in verse 25, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground, but you know, he offered it back up. He said, here, you know, here it is. Here is that talent that I hid. But his master answered, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I would reap where I had not sown and gather where I had uh, scattered no seed. So this, this whole situation here turned bad for this one person that did not obey. Simply did not obey. And down in verse 30, it reads, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We have responsibilities, and we just, if we just ignore them, push them aside, don't obey God, 
there's a place for us as well. It also makes our life miserable. Um, but the, in first, first Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So uh, did God put an evil spirit on this person? No. What happened? So the Spirit of God left him. Yeah. So what, what starts working in our minds when the Spirit of God leaves, leaves us? When we definitely know that we're being separated from God. I guess fear is going to creep in. The devil's going to creep in. And do, do we make ourselves miserable? We should make ourselves miserable. We should correct whatever it is we did wrong, but we should make ourselves miserable knowing that we have not, you know, not done what God wanted us to do. It's not something to fear. It's something to, to work through. Eric? The, the burden of trying to make a right or a wrong right is heavy, right? Because there's a, there has to be an acknowledgement that I screwed up, I committed sin, I was wrong. And so part of that acknowledgement is to God, and part of that is to my friends and my brothers and sisters. And that, that burden of, of admitting that seems very, very daunting. But for all of us that have, have done that, it's relieving when you do it. But it's that you have to overcome that fear that this is the step that I need to take to make it right. Not necessarily e easy. It renders one useless in the service of God. How does it render one useless? Well, if you're paralyzed with fear, you're not going to do anything. Yeah, we've, we've looked through some, you know, some good reasons why we should not fear, but this, this fear itself you know, keeps, us, it keeps your faith a secret. It keeps us from obeying God. It keeps us from confessing Christ. In, in that sense, it renders us useless. And then in, in, uh, in a couple of Old Testament examples, when, when God was going to send the Israelites into battle... He asked the people, are you afraid? Because if you're afraid, I want you to turn around and go home. It was plain and simple. He didn't want to have any part of that, that fearness that fell on the people. Craig? Well, ultimately, when you think about being useless in the service of God and to fear, it comes down to a matter of trust. So if you trust God, then you're going to be much more likely to, to be able to push through whatever fear you have and accomplish what he's asking you, whether that's in our day and age, uh, letting our light shine like we should you know, in this country, or we don't have to fear persecution, but we fear maybe ridicule, whether that's fearing for your life in other parts of the world, or even if you go back to some of those Old Testament examples, you know, think about Gideon, for instance, and some of the others, you know, they, they would not, they would be able to, to push through their fear. It doesn't mean it's going to be gone, but they'd be able to push through it if they trusted God. Um, you know, ultimately he did. Um, but, so, the thing is a lack of trust sometimes that makes it, makes fear render us useless. I'd like to comment on that too, because we can be, we're kind of, we're, we're kind of wading into dangerous waters, I guess, in binding things where that's not bound if we say that all fear is sin and as soon as you fear something you're in sin that's not true if you god and i'm i'm 
I'm, I'm under the assumption, and uh, I see it in the Bible, and I see it in his creation. The primal instincts that he gives us, his creation, those are for a purpose that God's designed. Now, what we do is we mess all that stuff up. We are supposed to fear God, and we're supposed to fear being denied by God. If that doesn't scare you, if that doesn't put the fear of you, if that doesn't make you afraid, there's something wrong with you. That's not good. So you need to be afraid to be denied by God. That moves you to action. That moves you not. So there's different. We are we're we're supposed to be afraid of things, but where the rubber meets the road is whenever we are not a coward and we push through those things. That's where courage comes from. That's where bravery comes from. That's where trust comes from. Is when we say, God, I'm afraid, but I trust you more than I trust in my fear. So I know that I'm afraid for a reason, but I'm not going to be a coward. I'm going to still do it. And I think fear should not stop us. To be afraid, it's like be angry, do not sit. Like, you can be afraid of something, but you better not let that stop you doing what God's called you to do. You still do it. Yeah, I think that 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 is part of what we were talking about at the beginning is the respect, the fear, the respect fear, as opposed to the I'm afraid that I'm going to be ridiculed by people or I'm afraid I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, an outcast. That, that's a good point. So in, this, in both those Old Testament uh, instances in, uh, well, it's especially the one in Judges, in that case, God was even even mentioned mentioned in, in the verses there that that He didn't want too many of the Israelites to show up for war because their number was great, but He did get, opt to let the people that were afraid stay home. So the people that weren't afraid, they uh, they they knew they were outnumbered at that point, but still showed that they trusted in God. And work through that fear. <clears throat> so it causes us to lose our soul. In Revelation chapter t 21 and verse 8. Now we've read this verse a number of times. It comes up again in this lesson. But be fearful and unbelieve that but but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake of uh, which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death so which which one tops the list and i'm not saying it tops the list as ranking from importance to to to, to you know one to ten and these aren't in alphabetical order but he starts out with which one? Out of all these bad sins that are going to lead one to the fear. Yeah, fear is the first one that's listed in here. So how do we overcome fear? And a couple of people have mentioned a couple of you have mentioned this in you know, our discussion so far tonight. We need to learn to trust God. And that is we're only able to do that if we know God. I, there are people here I don't know real well. I would probably still get in the car and maybe go down the road with you. But I wouldn't I wouldn't Put a nail on a board and have you hit it with me still holding it. I would not do that. Now, I would do it for my dad, but I would not do that for most of the people in here. And there's probably some people in here that maybe would do that for me, hold the nail while I hit it. But there's a lot of you that wouldn't. They don't have that trust because they don't know. They don't know how much control that I have of a hammer, and I don't know how much control you have of a hammer. So in our life, uh, in our life uh, events with God, do we trust Him? Do we know enough about Him? Have we learned enough about Him that we trust Him with, with everything? Absolutely everything that we trust Him. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of a man bringeth a snare, but 
Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, and I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him which hath, which after hath killed, hath power to cast you into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farlings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, that ye may be, you are more valuable than many sparrows. God reveals to mankind from the very beginning of time that we're important to him. Do we really believe that we're important to him? Do we really believe that? Some of the people I come in contact with at work, eh, I don't know if they think I'm important at all. Craig? Well, to think about what you've said so far, you know, the, about trusting in God, you read passages like this or you just look around us and you see what he's able to do, you see what he has done, you see his faithfulness, you know, you can trust that he has our, your best interests in mind. And so when you're faced with a situation that the, the way to overcome fear is to trust in God, you know, there's no reason not to go in, not to go all in. Um, you know, you don't know how many hairs are on my head, so maybe I wouldn't pull the nail for you, even though I think you have good intentions. But God does. And, you know, he knows everything about us, and he's proven to be trustworthy, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Eric? Part of that too is also an acknowledgement that just because something bad happens to me doesn't mean that I should stop trusting God. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. And so that, that's something that's hard to get over, but it's, it's critical to our trust in God. Because if something bad happens to me, am I going to question God for what he's done to me? Right, is, is the way we look at it. Instead of, yeah. God, I trust you, and if this has happened, then I'm going to learn, I'm going to figure out a way to make this for your glory and for your own. Yeah. It's like Craig was saying, there, there's just too much to we, if we have, we just need to stop and think of all the blessings that we've got. God, God has proven time and time again that he'll take care of us. I mean, even even when the, the he's already proven to the world that he'll sacrifice his son to save us. So, you know, if you're having trouble figuring something out, you just, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I, I have just as much anxiety as the next person, but it happens. I mean, just before we moved from our last house. I needed a I needed a thousand dollars to send Nick to camp. I was trying to figure out every which way I could think to do it, more overtime, whatever. And we were getting ready to play paintball, and all of a sudden this massive wind comes by and blows this tree that's like 50 inches in diameter over. Two days later, some guy comes in and offers a thousand, says, "Hey, I'll give you a thousand dollars for that. It's a nice piece of." Oak. So you know it happens. So, and I, got, I always try to continually remind myself that I've never gone without. I, I don't get what I want, I get what I need. And, you know, those, those, just those little things help me sleep at night. Some of the things you see at work or things that we see during the day, we know that God's in control and that we just got to trust. And that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. We've got to continually trust in God and convince ourselves we're not going to do anything without Him. Yeah. And, and that's, that's hard for us to do. I'm, when, I, when I go to work, there, there are people that will say you, don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody. If you want to get ahead in this life, you know, you do, do it yourself. But we really do. 
without a doubt, need to trust in God. And it's, it's, it's been, he's been proven over and over and over through the Bible that he knows what's best for us. He absolutely knows what's best. We just need to lean on him. <clears throat> and we need to learn to live in the presence of God. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, we read there, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So may, we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. So here we are, Zippy. Back, back to what you were talking about earlier. Trusting in him. Being content with what we have. If we need something better, he'll, he'll see to it. <clears throat> and I'm going to go and read, read uh, uh, Psalms chapter 46, verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear through the, uh, through the earth gives way, do the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea? If that would happen, you know, do I need to worry about it? If I'm, if I'm good with God, I don't need to worry about it at all. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. <clears throat> That's another way to overcome the fear that we often have inside ourselves. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13, uh, 13 to 15, it reads, now, now, who is here to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the holy, or the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope that is in you. Yet, do not uh, do it with gentleness and respect. And when I, when I read and, and hear about what it was like in the time that these books were written, We've got it made compared to what they had back then. We don't have people coming up to us, not here in this land that we live in, and, and physically persecuting us for claiming we know God, we trust that Jesus is the Son of God, we confess that. We don't have bad things happening to us. But sometimes we just kind of shelter ourselves from from the world. Pardon me? There is something going on. <clears throat> right. Just not here. Not on, not on, well, not to the extent that these people had it. Then we need to learn to put on our, our uh, <clears throat> spiritual armor. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, again, But in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always, giving, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it generously and with respect. And I will never forget... We had a, a, a gentleman that, that came into our work group years, years back that he would give God praise at, at least five times a day. He didn't like, you know, we, we see people that just say it like every sentence that comes out of their mouth. But Bo, Bo had a way about him that he would, he would bring God into the conversation and he would just, you know, just mention it just nonchalantly different times during the day. 
always with a, you know, with a good reason, a good purpose. Um, and I've often thought, I, I need to be more like Bo. I need to be more like him. He did not fear what other people thought of him for his religion. He did not fear it at all. We need to put on the whole armor of God. And the only way we can put on the whole armor of God is, is how? How do you know you have the whole armor of God on? If I was going to go to boot camp, military boot camp for the Navy, are there guidelines for what I'd put on? Or I just walk in with jeans or shorts and a t-shirt and say, I'm here. What would we put on? For boot camp, what would I put on? Jake? This doesn't line up with your analogy, but uh, if we think of David, whenever uh, Saul was trying to put, put this armor on him before he fought, he, he rejected it. He said, no, I've not tested this armor. I've not used it. Like, I have no practice or experience with it. I'm not going to use it. Like, it, it's the same thing with the spiritual armor. It's not going to work for us if we don't use it. Like, we, we have to put it on and go ahead and start feeling it out before we necessarily think we need it because we always need it and that's you know we, we so we need to spend more time utilizing those tools that we see in the in, in these in this passage more often when we don't necessarily feel under attack or you know we need to test them we need to try them out we need to practice with them not just when we feel like we need it and to to be able to get get the sword to penetrate well and to be able to make the armor, you know, bounce, you know, bounce the stuff right off of us, we have to be used to that ourselves of wearing it. So we got to use it. Yeah, yep. Good, good points, Rich. It, to continue on what he was saying, just, it's, um, when you do go boot, through boot camp, they give you a gas mask. They want to make sure that you, you can actually use the thing. Mm -hmm. And you have to trust it, and you have to, you have all the training that you get to use it, they want to make sure that you believe it, that it works. So they take you into a room about half this size and they put it, they, they pump it full of tear gas. And you walk in there, it looks just like this. And then they're like, okay, and you're waiting for them to pump gas in or something like that. They're like, okay, this, this is what it's like. And the guys are like, sure it is. They're like, take your mask off. And then they take it off. And then it's like, yeah, here come the tears, man. It, it, you, can't, you can't breathe, you can't see. And so the whole thing is, you have to know what you're employing before you, you go to have to use it. Carry a Bible and then go to talk to somebody about it. It's not, it's not a whole lot of use. You've got to go fumble through it. And I'm not, I'm not the greatest example, sometimes I, I'm not the shining example of a Christian it should be, but you know you try. When you make a mistake, you admit it, you move on. You try to ask for forgiveness and that's that. But um, if, if you don't continually practice and practice and practice at, at this stuff, it isn't going to be ever second nature. That, that, absolutely. Kevin? Uh, the armor of God is kind of like tools. They're, they're, they're characteristics which make us complete. But having, having tools and not being able to use them isn't very helpful. Uh, the armor of God helps us defend ourselves. But it's not very good when somebody's just defensive. We defend ourselves because that doesn't bother me. That doesn't sway me. But then we have some other things that are offensive, not offending, but where we are the one asking the question or making somebody think, but still with meekness and fear. We know how to use it. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Eric? Part of the answer to your question about from a military standpoint, a lot of it is about changing attitudes and changing perspective. Um, to, to, to gain the person's commitment to the objective and to the mission. 
And so a verse that, that's after what you have listed, verse 18, praying at all times. You want to talk about how we change our perspective so that we know how to use the tools, so we're motivated to use the tools, praying at all times. Prayer is so, so important to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Craig, did you have, you want to add something? Just take everything that's been said about tools and how to use them and all that. Think about how like, overcoming fear when you take any other situation that you have, when you know what you're doing and when you have confidence in it, you know, you're not afraid. So if it's standing up and teaching a class or giving a sermon, you know, if you know the material well, uh, you can speak with confidence. If it's, you know, if you're going to go stand and in a karate fight with somebody and you're well practiced and you know how to, to do it you're in a tournament you're going to do well you're going to be able to take the things that you have and with confidence do what you're supposed to do so it's so different with the spiritual armor you know, Peter talks about giving the answer Paul talks about using the word of God and being ready um, have confidence in what, what tools you have and fear melts away yeah, anybody else have any comments here? So, I think one thing that helps me to overcome fear is when I start thinking about not just my potential for failure, but that my potential for success is also in God's hands. Like, if I succeed, it's not because I was better or more deserving or, you know, it's because God gave me the success. Um, and that takes a lot of the fear of failure away when you start thinking in those terms. At least it does for me. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely helps. So so where I was trying to go with this analogy with uh, the military is the military boot camp for whichever division your string you're going to go under, they're going to give you the instructions that you need. They're going to give you the tools that you need. They're going to make sure you have that you are well equipped. Whatever it is that you need to be a Navy SEAL, they're going to give it to you. Whatever you need to be uh, an air pilot, they're going to give it to you. Whatever you need to be a Christian, God's given it to you. He's given it to us in His Word. All we need to be a Christian. But unless we get in there and, and work with it, and, and like, Zibi, like you said, practice it, we're not going to grab it all. And Chances are we'll never grab it all. Even the most uh, well-educated Bible scholar doesn't know at all. But God expects us to know more as we go along. He expects us to learn more. And I will probably never be comfortable up here, no matter how much I know the material. No matter how many times I've read the material, no matter how I've studied the material, I'll never be comfortable up here. Never. I tell, my, tell Tina, it's always at least 5 to 10 degrees hotter up here than it is anywhere else in the building. Not that it physically is, but wherever I am, it is. Wherever I am. And the last that was mentioned to Elaine's point is, is prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. So after he talks about putting on the whole armor of God... In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, we read there, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then in Psalms chapter 55 and verse 22, it's research, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. And answer, Elaine already answered the question about the, how do we, uh, you know, how does prayer give us strength? So I appreciate it. Appreciate all the comments in class. I have went ahead. If you were filling out the uh, fill in the blanks, here's the verses. First one is cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. We just read that verse. Um, 
In Psalms chapter 34 and 4, I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. In Matthew 28, or Matthew 10 and 28, and do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In John chapter 17, or John chapter 7, verse 13, yet for fear the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to uh, stand against the schemes of the devil. And Philippians chapter 4, 6, and 7, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, for th with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which <clears throat> surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. And the last two are up here, we'll let the classes come in. Thank you, everybody.